this computer. All right, I am now recording. Good morning, this is Dale Lamb from Gardner Webb. This is the final defense for Jim Rennie and uh, Doctor of Ed Education and Organizational Leadership. Jim, welcome this morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity. Uh, this has been an enjoyable project for me and it's uh, just neat to kind of walk through it and uh, give you some thoughts. If you look at the title slide here, there's a lot of words there. And uh, candidly, I'm glad I'm not paying by the letter here or I'd probably be uh, poor. But the one word I'll keep coming back to throughout this entire presentation is uh, the word intentional. Um, in many ways, this brief is still conceptual. Uh, it's a, a unsolicited proposal of sorts. If we get to the point of execution, there'll still need to be a fair amount more uh, specificity and analysis associated with it. Uh, I'd like to uh, open with a John Maxwell quote. And uh, Maxwell said, the big, single biggest way to impact an organization is to focus on leadership development. And I think that's an appropriate uh, reinforcement of this concept. Okay, as far as background and purpose, uh, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to uh, teach here at Gardner-Webb undergraduate students for uh, seven semesters, getting ready to start my eighth semester. And it is, uh, besides being a joy, it's kind of opened my eyes to today's students. And if I step back and look at leadership development, it's actually a topic that I'm finding most students are uh, very much have an appetite for. Uh, in my international relations class, for example, I have introduced a optional leadership paper on a, a global figure. And it is probably one of the most popular topics that people write on. So that's just kind of an anecdotal data point that I think people come to college and there's a yearning for, uh, okay, what's after the classroom and how am I going to succeed here? And that's uh, the influence and in leadership that we uh, talk about. Uh, also, the DEOL -E program, um, there's two things that I really am taking away from this program. Number one is, here's my word again, the need for intentionality and leadership development. And then number two, the universality, uh, if that's a word, uh, for leadership development. In other words, people aren't born leaders, uh, just like a math skill or a writing skill, people can develop the leadership skills. And that really hit me, and I think that was uh, one of the cornerstones uh, of this uh, presentation. Then the last bullet talks about the mission statement of Gardner-Webb. Um, if you go to the strategic plan, uh, and I'll read the paragraph here, it says the mission of Gardner-Webb University is to prepare graduates for leadership and service in their professional careers and in their personal lives. Rigorous and innovative degree programs combined with distinctive experiential learning opportunities shape students into thinkers, doers, and world changers. And to me, the operative words throughout that are prepare graduates for leadership and experiential learning. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit about experiential learning during this presentation. What's interesting is if you look at a lot of mission statements for universities around the country, you'll find very similar words. But in many cases, I would almost advocate in most cases, the universities don't really get really intentional about their mission statements. Um, Tom Kolditz, who is the director of the uh, Door Institute for New Leaders at Rice University, had this to say, in the best case, what's supposed to build leadership abilities is more often focused on professional or career development, such as training on how to interview well or to network effectively. And this project will propose an organization, Center of Excellence for Leadership, that will hopefully uh, bridge that gap. I use the, uh, in the action research plan, I use the mixed uh, methodology, uh, just highlight the note up in the yellow box, this report focused only on undergraduates. Um, as Dr. Lamb was more than aware of, there are many other processes associated with graduate leading, uh, learning for leadership, and that is not appropriate here. Uh, I really enjoyed this aspect of uh, this project, and it's probably one of the bigger things I'm walking away with is this equilateral triangle shows three different legs that all kind of go together 
And uh, candidly, I don't think I was thinking that when I first sat down to do this project. Um, I did bounce around between the faces. I, I think that uh, is realistic. I'll start in the lower left-hand corner though with a qualitative. Uh, when I determined the project that I wanted to, to write on, <clears throat> I did do some initial background. I uh, did a bunch of just uh, open searching for universities that might have leadership centers. Uh, and I found a couple, uh, Rice University in Houston and University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about those. Uh, Richmond University up in Virginia has a leadership uh, major and uh, gets academic credit. That's not the path I elected to go down. I talked to Furman, they are predominantly in one of their schools. And then my alma mater Air Force actually has a leadership and character development center. So I had the opportunity to have several interviews. Uh, I also was out in Colorado on vacation and I went over to Air Force Academy and I happened to know somebody in the senior leader there, sat down with him and had a couple of follow-ons. So those interviews and those observations kind of helped set the pace in, in my mind for uh, uh, the rest of the program. If I bounce up to the top, uh, I did release four sets of surveys to uh, current Gardner-Webb undergraduates, uh, Gardner-Webb alumni, Gardner-Webb faculty, concentrating on undergraduates. And then what I list as community are people in the community that have hired Gardner-Webb students uh, before. I used uh, Likert four-point scale. And kind of the purpose uh, for the, these surveys was to get a feeling for how these four different bodies uh, felt about leadership preparation uh, at Gardner-Webb. Uh, was it effective? And then I kind of ended all of the uh, sessions with, do they think there would be value added? Or I ended all of the surveys with uh, one question on, would there be value added if uh, we instituted a center of excellence for leadership at Gardner-Webb? I won't go into the specifics, but I'll kind of generalize it. I, I think all of the surveys basically came back and were fairly positive that they thought at the macro level, Gardner-Webb was doing a good job of leadership preparation. But then follow-on questions were directed at specific leadership skills, um, working in groups, critical thinking, communication. And here the data was quite a bit uh, muddier, for lack of a better word, which kind of, to me, was a, a, a little bit of a uh, informal proof that the lack of specificity and the lack of intentionality in the program does not lend oneself towards good leadership development. One other thing took away from the surveys was um, a lot of undergraduates uh, are not necessarily interested in doing something else, piling something else up on their plate. So I was a little surprised with the undergraduates that they didn't jump on the fact that we would have a uh, a leadership center that they could take advantage of. Um, but I, I'll come back to that, but I'll, I'll just give you a data point from the Door Institute at Rice. Uh, I'm proposing a voluntary center for students. Rice has a voluntary center for students. Their program is so good that after three years, they have had 30% of the undergraduate student population enrolled in their program. So I think if you build it, they will come if it's good. I also did do some uh, resource estimates, uh, talked to several people on the, the campus to try to get a rough order of magnitude of cost. Uh, candidly, I think uh, if I ever move this to execution, that's the part that uh, probably will need a fair amount more work um, on this whole thing. Uh, and then uh, finally, on the lower right-hand side, which we'll move to next, uh, it was very interesting to incorporate some expert opinions on what does it mean to learn? What's the best way to learn uh, from a theoretical standpoint? And then I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about the two schools that I think have great programs, Rice and, uh, and Michigan. So the hypothesis for this program is, um, Gardner-Webb is very interested in undergraduate leadership development Although there are leadership events, programs, and courses on the campus, there is not a synchronized and holistic approach. The university does not formally teach leadership development or measure the success of their programs. So the intentionality and follow through do not facilitate optimum results. Increased and intentional leadership development will increase 
leadership attributes in the undergraduate population. So again, let's move to the lower right-hand corner and talk about some theory. Um, I thought this was uh, actually very interesting. In 1974, Chris Argus and Ron Schoen studied learning theory and developed a theory of action, they called it, with two main attributes, uh, espouse theories and theories in use. And espouse theories are those uh, we know about and we espouse to ourselves. And theories in use are theories of actions implied by our behavior likely to be unknown by us. So what the learner approaches a problem is, he more than likely will approach it with these theories in use of these hidden values that uh, have worked for him before, and he's gonna do it again. In 1976, Argus expanded on these initial thoughts by creating the double loop learning theory. And he felt it was important to connect effective uh, learning theories with leadership education. And simplistically, he said, good leaders must understand what influences them in their various encounters with problem solving to include those embedded actions that are deeply seated in them. Um, the objective is to teach leadership experientially, according to Argus, and to force the learner to deal with hidden feelings and beliefs that require innovative solutions, not doing the same thing again. And uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. Argus went on to say that there are four things that people, most people have to unlearn if they wanna really get into effective learning. Uh, first is to achieve the purpose as the individual defined it. Um, most people look at a problem and they uh, define it with what they've uh, looked at before. They also approach a problem with how do I win and not lose? Uh, third is suppress negative feelings. And then fourth, emphasize rationality. And uh, Argus emphasized that in learning, it's okay to fail. And uh, he was real big on trying to make learning not just the single loop thermostat where it, it reacts to the uh, temperature, but a double loop thermostat that analyzes the environment for the conditions and, and goes beyond that. And he classified these as model one learning and model two learning. And model one learning is uh, traditional education, textbooks and lectures, maybe some simple exercises. And this kind of equates to a single loop thermostat. And again, the person tends to default to what they've done before. Model two learning, on the other hand, considers more inputs from their environment, allows other stakeholders to get involved quite a bit more. And the end result is that the person that's learning usually uh, looks at and considers more uh, inputs than, than normal. And I was trying to think up of an example to kind of put this in place. And uh, I came up with uh, my background in the military was an uh, aviation pilot of a large multi-crew aircraft. And every time that you would go and transition to fly a new aircraft, uh, you went through a very deliberate process. And the first step in the process was you went to academics. And you had an instructor up at the board, and you had a lot of schematics on um, electrical system, hydraulic system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you transitioned to maybe some part task trainers where you looked at normal procedures. Um, and it was really still not kind of in your face, for lack of a better word, still fairly comfortable. That I equate to model one learning. Then you move to the next phase, was a full motion simulator. And in a full motion simulator, um, you test everything. You test and you see the interconnectivity of the systems. And more importantly, you really do see the leadership of a multi-crew aircraft uh, because you're in a real world situation that you can't get out of. And that's exactly what uh, he wanted to, Argus wanted to uh, learning development to become is try to put people in those situations where they're uncomfortable, where failing is okay and where they can walk away from it. Well, from a theoretic, from a literature standpoint, I want to concentrate for a minute on two schools that I think are doing exactly that. Uh, the first one is the University of Michigan, the Sanger uh, Leadership Center. In 2006, the Ross Leadership Initiative was established as actually um, part of their uh, business school. And it was based on research 
by doctors Ashford and LaRue, and they called it mindful engagement. And mindful to me is another, or it's a synonym of intentionality. And they, these two doctors came up with basically three phases of how students should learn, the approach, the action, and the reflection. And the approach phase is probably often overlooked when people get into a learning situation is the instructor and the student or students sit down with the instructor and they go over the objectives of the session. Um, and they talk about any role playing that might occur and the methodology uh, associated with the whole thing. Uh, and, and that actually is a very important step. Then they go into the second stage was the, the action stage. And what's important here is uh, the instructor and student talk about feedback up front. Feedback is something that is hard to give in a leadership development situation. Uh, a lot of people don't like giving uh, not positive feedback and students definitely don't like receiving not positive feedback. So it's important to kind of lay the ground rules for that. And then the final section is reflection. And that's kind of looking backwards to look forward. And they bring up this concept of a AAR after action review. Uh, we use those in the military extensively. We flew a formation flight. When that five hour flight is done, we all regathered in the briefing room and we went through soup to nuts uh, from the initial briefing to did the crew bus arrive on time to every single facet uh, of the, uh, the flight. And the whole purpose of that was to take away something that we can apply to uh, the next brief or the next flight. The second university I highlight is Rice University at uh, the Door Institute um, for new uh, learners. Um, in 2015, uh, John Door gave Rice University a large sum of money. Um, I forgot to mention too, also in 2015, back at Michigan, a guy named Steven Sanger gave them a lot of money. So both these schools uh, have received, have been benefactors of a large donation uh, with governance associated with it. And that is a great way to keep an organization going. But back to uh, Rice real quick, John Doerr uh, gave the university a large sum of money and he came up with four first principles for this leadership center. Leadership de development should be considered a core function of a college or university. Leadership development initiatives should be evidence-based approached rather than simply following the latest fad or long beloved method. Number three, leadership development initiatives should employ professional leader developers, not just well intentioned, but untrained volunteers. One of the hallmarks of uh, this program is their coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and it's done by only ICF or international coach uh, certified people. Um, and, and I thought that was actually uh, very good. And then finally, most importantly, rigorous measurement of desired outcomes, not just body counts, <clears throat> should preside over any serious development enterprise. And this is what sets uh, Rice University um, apart. If you look at this slide over here, uh, where my uh, cursor's moving, this represents what um, uh, Rice calls leader identity scores. So what the door center does is they have developed a uh, pretty comprehensive survey uh, that they give to all of their um, students that come through their programs before and after um, and then they also this is pretty fascinating they give this same survey to every undergraduate at rice uh, before they graduate on top of that the uh, data managers at the door institute factor in uh, jobs that students are holding on campus, whether that be in student government, with a club, uh, with an athletic team. And that all gets rolled into the gronculator and they come up with these uh, leader identity scores. And it, it's actually an incredible way to measure um, the effectiveness of your program and a good opportunity to show uh, how leadership development can really be uh, handled in that way. So shaping the research, molding that all together, um, I walked away with three main points. And it's kind of the way I started this, but it was just accentuated. Leadership development doesn't just happen. Back to our word of intentionality. 
Number two, it is important to use multiple learning processes, uh, experiential. And again, I go back to my aircraft simulation um, illustration. And then number three, and probably most important, measurement of progress in learning development is key. And out of uh, the, the schools of Rice, Michigan, and then uh, Air Force, um, I walked away with a couple of best practices that I'm incorporating into this proposal. Uh, from Michigan, Sanger School, they have an amazing experiential crisis leader, leadership exercise. And this goes over a 24 hour period and uh, students are selected for role playing in an organization and uh, they are given problems and then they have to periodically throughout the day brief a board of directors who are uh, no kidding real business leaders or community leaders in real life. Uh, then when it's all done, um, the local media comes in and they give them practice media uh, um, operations. And, and that's just amazing. That's the kind of program that you go, wow, that, that's just good stuff. Um, number two from the Door Institute, their coaching program is top rate. Uh, again, they use only certified coaches and my proposal, that's all I recommend that we use as well. And then more importantly, I think the Door Institute measures learning uh, better than anybody in the country. And then Air Force Academy, um, they do a student-led annual conference. And I think that's a great idea. And it's managed by their leadership center. And uh, this last year, they had Elon Musk. Year before that, they had uh, Bob Gates, former Secretary of Defense. So I think there's a lot that can come from that to uh, get the students to jump in and run a good leadership conference like that. And those are three things that I'll incorporate into my program. So my approach in doing this was this animal called a center of excellence. I had an old boss that would ask, who wakes up every morning thinking about, and then he'd say, pick a subject. So I'm kind of taking that along in this project with who wakes up every day on this campus thinking about leadership. Um, I don't know of anybody to be blunt. Uh, if that's, and that's their only job that they do. Well, my proposal is the creation of this uh, center of excellence um, for uh, leadership uh, to do this. Now, uh, a little bit about um, this center of excellence, because I think this is the adoption point that uh, I could apply uh, when this program's over with to any mission set. Center of excellence is cross-functional. Uh, it can be temporary, it can be permanent in nature. Uh, it absolutely needs to have a good charter and governance associated with it, or it will not last. Um, I got the opportunity when I was in the military to start a center of excellence, a, a, a organization between operations and logistics. I was the head of the operations part a good friend of mine was the head of the logistics part. And while two good friends were doing it, it worked great. And even though we had a charter, we were followed by uh, two people that were not good friends and it kind of started to go downhill. So a center of excellence, again, needs to be revisited quite a bit and it needs to have governance uh, clearly uh, spelled out. Now, what's gonna be uh, unique about this particular center of excellence is um, it will be the leadership development focal point for the university. It doesn't have to do everything, but in my mind, it ought to be the guy that wakes up or gal that wakes up every day and says, let me tell you about what's leadership going on in the nursing department or in the divinity school or in the athletic department. And oh, by the way, here in our uh, leadership center, we offer these programs. Number two, and maybe a little bit more controversial, I am proposing that this leadership center work directly for the Gardner-Webb University president. Um, I'm more used to organizations that uh, below the chief executive have uh, some people that help bridge all the different functions together, whether that be a chief operating officer or the military, a lot of times that's a chief of staff or even a deputy that runs across the whole perspective. My concern, if the COE does not work directly for the president, is it'll get lost. And if it goes to the business school, people in the educational school say, well, that's just a business program. And if it goes to the education, 
people say that's just a in business school say that's just an education so i really think for this thing to work it needs to have some pretty high horsepower up there i'm proposing this is not for academic credit this is uh, purely voluntary um, so this are students that want to improve their uh, leadership development um, the ideal methodology is no cost to the students. Ultimately, the COE can give some form of certifications and or partner with the existing certification programs on campus. Although not primary, this could be a uh, minor source of additional income for them. Um, and then again, I'm really proposing professional coaching. I think that could be a cornerstone of this whole process. On the right hand side, I call this crawl, walk, run. When I first started this project, uh, I thought I built a timeline, built my initial charter, uh, put it in Blackboard, and it had a 18 months uh, start to finish. And it didn't take me long to realize this ain't going to happen. Uh, I have not been in higher education all that long, but I'll talk in a minute about some organizational resistance that this will probably encounter. And then number two, uh, the need for thorough review. And number three, the fact that in higher education, um, nothing happens fast. <laughs> so I came up with three phases, each a year apart. Uh, uh, from the initial to the ending is a three-year process of three academic years. And I think that coincides with uh, some staffing that I'll talk about a little bit more. But phase one from August 23 to July 24, is the crawl phase. I call it consolidation and staffing. Uh, one centralized website, everything going on leadership on the campus is there. The director is in place with a very small staff. And this person is uh, being the advocate running around and uh, trying to pull everything together. More importantly, during this year, the director is staffing the uh, COE charter and the director is staffing the leadership roadmap uh, for the campus, for the school in general. And I think both of those are key. Phase two is the next year, August 24 to July 25. I'll show you some more specifics uh, in a minute, um, but anticipate that this is the initial operating capability. And uh, my budget plan has about 50 students in the center at about phase two. And phase three is about 75 students when uh, we really kind of, by the end of phase three, July 26, we were definitely running. And assuming we made all our milestones, uh, everything should be uh, on track that way. So from a uh, SMART or goal perspective or scope perspective, I kind of put some deadlines um, down here. And again, you'll see the uh, phased in uh, approach and uh, part and parcel to the latter parts of this is the reality that uh, since this is voluntary, if there's a good return on investment for students and it's a successful program and it continues uh, down that path. It will have operational funding, but uh, you need people to be sitting in the seats ultimately. And that's where it's on the onus of the center to uh, do their best job. I'll camp for a minute at the latter one, August 26, Carnegie Leadership Application. Um, the Carnegie Institute has just established a new designation of Carnegie Select designation for leadership. Uh, Rice University is the administrative head for this. There are 152 schools that are starting to apply for this process. I just went to a Zoom session last week uh, that Rice hosted. It'll be an 18 month process for this first round right now um, for all of the schools to uh, apply for this. As you'll see in my recommendations, I think this is a great idea for or a Gardner Webb to move towards. Um, the school will learn so much uh, about what their leadership program is by just going through this process. And we'll see gaps. And that's part, probably the biggest part of this whole thing is you can see gaps and see where they need to fill in. Uh, as far as communication and engagement plan, um, I think this will be critical. Um, I'm not gonna be naive and say that uh, higher education is an organization where everybody every morning wakes up and comes together and um, sings kumbaya and is on the same page. Uh, from my limited perspective of being in higher education for three years, I see some pretty good stovepipes or silos. Um, 
And I think it's going to be part and parcel again. The key to the success of this organization is somehow that gets bridged. So uh, in my meetings with um, probably the deputy provost is, uh, and even the provost I talked to, uh, they both agreed that there needs to be some form of initial concept approval before this thing gets off, off the ground. And uh, that would be through the president's cabinet. So timeline, timeline wise, I anticipate that um, the uh, director would go to the president's cabinet, get approval to start the three year phased in approach and the uh, detailed timeline to follow from that. Uh, the second bullet talks about a formal COE charter approval through the new academic program development. Since this is not necessarily academic, and my objective is to hit all three of these silos, um, athletics, uh, faculty, maybe eventually staff, park that one to the side for a minute now. Uh, I was asking some senior leaders around campus, is there any good approval process for that? And the deputy provost turned me on to the this 12 month process of new program, academic program development. It's a 12 month cycle. I think it can run very well concurrently with phase one and it fleshes out specificity of funding, uh, everything that I'm after. So I think that would actually um, work very good. So at the end of the day, I think the stakeholder engagement plan is absolutely vital for implementation and sustainment. And I like what John Maynard Keynes, the British economist once said, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas and is escaping from old ones. Uh, I would advocate that higher education needs to escape from many existing methods of uh, leadership and uh, development. Well, like any project, there are risks and constraints. Um, the good part is this proposal is additive to Gardner-Webb. So at the macro level, there are no direct risks to the institution if the uh, COE is not adopted. But what I would rather say is there are huge opportunity losses for the university. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the need to increase intentionality and leadership development. And I think this COE gives us a great opportunity, a great methodology to do that. Uh, additionally, constraints, um, this uh, depiction on the left kind of highlights three of them. I think the two biggest ones that this project will have would be a uh, scope uh, and costs. And the scope, again, gets back into uh, this charter and exactly what the organization does and doesn't do. Um, I did meet with one senior leader on the campus. And at the end of the session, the person turned to me and said, this is a great idea, but uh, don't mess with my stuff. And I just think that's uh, symbolic or representative of exactly uh, what we're gonna need. And senior leadership uh, is uh, really what sets everything apart. This is a slide of deliverables. Um, you can kind of see the first three being phase one, the next four or so being phase two, and then the end, bottom being phase three. Uh, you can see the phased in approach again and uh, kind of give some uh, specificity. I would advocate that by phase three, you really do have some pretty good return on investment on the uh, coaching programs. And uh, second from the bottom is leadership measurement. You, you'll see in my recommendations that um, I think it's absolutely essential, um, kind of like Rice did, that the university establish exactly what are they trying to do and develop leaders as students. Um, I'll show you some specificity that Rice has, and I think it's pretty neat. And I th think that's paramount that uh, to move forward in intentional leadership development. And we already talked about uh, the, the Carnegie proposal. I think quality assurance will be uh, absolutely uh, key. Uh, again, not to keep harping on it, but um, I think this organization will have a bullseye on it from minute one, and uh, it's going to have to be uh, very visible. I think the first director of this organization is going to have to be a uh, person with a very good personality that uh, can kind of be accepted widely. It's kind of a cheerleader, a good organizer, 
and a, a data pursuer because you're going to really need data to show the value of this organization or funding will get uh, squashed out and it'll just kind of uh, die a short death. From a formative standpoint, I can see a lot of surveys going out. Um, that's part of what Rice does and I think it's a great idea. You'll definitely do some feedback as to the uh, students. Um, we talked about the student leadership scores. Uh, I think that's absolutely essential. From a summative standpoint, over time, we can measure those uh, student leadership ideas. And then, uh, not to sound too simplistic, but anecdotally, since this is a voluntary program, the biggest feedback we're going to get is the number of student participants. Uh, when I talk to people at Rice, uh, several people on their staff, they were, they're turning people away. Uh, so they have a very good program. And that's exactly what you want. And that's how you uh, get sustainment associated with this. And then finally, I always say that accountability is your friend. And I think it's going to be very important for this organization to use outside assessment for, uh, for a holistic review. And uh, if we take advantage of professional coaches, uh, that's they usually have a pretty good background in uh, assessment. And I think that that would uh, really be in, important. So recommendations. I'm a firm believer that uh, the, or, the school should accept this whole thing lock, stock, and barrel and uh, set up a center of excellence. I think it could be done significantly quicker if it had uh, the proper funding and the right a backing of senior leadership in mind. But putting my realistic hat on now, I think there's a couple of things that the school can do right away to uh, increase um, the culture, leadership culture here at Gardner Webb. First, um, be more intentional about leadership development. There's a program going around the campus, definitely at the undergraduate level, called Writing Across the Campus. And the impetus of that is whether you're teaching science or math or international relations like I do, uh, you need to have writing assignments where students practice uh, communication in that way. Well, I would adapt that and add to it and say, let's have leadership across the campus. Whether you're teaching science, math, international relations, bring in leadership. Um, I've started doing that in my class and uh, it's actually fascinating uh, we run around the world and we're talking specifics about uh, guys like President Bolsonaro in uh, Brazil, uh, Putin, Zelensky, uh, all these uh, fairly well-known people, good and bad. And it's, it's actually pretty neat. And I try to hone in on the students and get them to help me define what the best part of leadership is. Additionally, I think we can do increased leadership intentionality with um, a lot of other small things. Uh, how about as you enter Tucker on the TV screens, uh, maybe have some leadership signs, leadership slogans, maybe in the CAF uh, have those as well. And on all the web or all of these places, have a simple 30 second John Maxwell video uh, encouraging people to uh, think about leadership. Because again, it's uh, just not gonna happen. Second recommendation, is I think the school should definitely ID the leadership attributes uh, that, that we talked about. Let me spend a minute about what Rice does on this. Um, and I think this is a great way to start. Uh, Rice uh, identifies 21 competencies, and this comes from research by Lombardo and Eichinger in 2009, and they're organized into five themes, and they address individual or group relationships and they re represent this intentional architecture we're talking about. Theme one, working with others. Not surprisingly, um, they're going to address conflict management, team building, collaboration, delegation, negotiation, effective communication. Theme two, being aware of others, cross-cultural resourcefulness, ethical responsibility, empathetic engagement. Team three, knowing yourself, purposefulness, self-confidence, self-awareness. Theme four, controlling yourself, self-regulation, balance, decision-making, perseverance. And then theme five, knowing yourself, innovative thinking, love of learning, vision casting, um, enterprise initiative. So again, this is a, a great first step in my mind of, okay, university, what are you really trying to see coming out the other end? 
at a level of specificity, specificity that you need. Uh, third, I think the university should definitely apply for the Carnegie elective classification for leadership. It's a long process, but I think the university will learn quite a bit in going down uh, this path. And then finally, uh, I think this represents a unique opportunity for the school to integrate the Charlotte campus more and uh, kind of bring in uh, experts from, from uh, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte is a large city, similar to Houston. Uh, if you're only going to have certified coaches in your program, you're probably not going to find them in Boiling Springs or Shelby. You're more likely to find them in, uh, in Charlotte. Uh, Rice University uh, does do some things virtually as well, so they don't all have to be in person. But I think this represents a unique opportunity to kind of bridge the gap again, which I know is one of the things that's in the uh, strategic plan. All right, as far as reflections, a um, couple of things for me to uh, highlight walking away. Um, I really did enjoy the uh, DEOL program. Um, I thought it was uh, very practical. It is exactly kind of the tools and the toolkit that the leaders should have in refining their skills. I think as far as the courses that meant the most to me, um, I have had some time as a chief of staff in a couple of organizations. So maybe it's a sick side of me, but uh, organizational behavior theory and development, I thought were actually uh, pretty neat and pretty foundational for it. Uh, the other course that I really enjoyed was the personal assessment course. Um, I've always thought that I had uh, good people skills. Uh, when I took those tests, um, I realized that I ain't as good as I think I was. And uh, I thought that that was very, very beneficial. I know that there were some uh, uh, kinks in my leadership armor that I tended to minimize. And uh, what that assessment told me is that I'm really not going to improve myself until I really uh, work on those. Uh, as far as the consultancy project, I really enjoyed the action research methodology. And I thought that that was um, very, very, very useful. If I did it over again, what I would do is not really change anything, but I would modify my qualitative assessment. Um, I did have some thematic interviews after my um, surveys went out, but I think I really would like to do more of that because I think that's where the value really comes in. I do think it's important to do some observations and interviews up front, do your quantitative analysis, and then come back really in force. And, and that's probably, um, what I would do. From a personal standpoint, um, I really appreciated the way the, the program just kept honing that leadership development is um, something that can be learned by everybody. And that's the genesis of this whole project. And I, I really do believe that. And I don't think that's taught very well. And I don't think philosophically that's taught very well. And I think a lot of people um, have to suffer with the fact that um, they think that they, they may be, uh, are not born leaders. And then the last thing is uh, from a personal standpoint, I thought the cohort experiences were absolutely essential. Uh, number one, I think we had to have a great cohort and I think everybody gets along real well. And number two for me, um, I'm not a spring chicken and uh, I have spent about 42 years working all in the Department of Defense. So what was refreshing to me and actually important to me was that I got to see leadership through different lenses than what I've used all my life. And it really opened up uh, my aperture, which I thought was uh, really pretty neat. So kind of before I turn over to questions, um, I'll give you my elevator speech. Three main points, uh, intentionality, it just, leadership development just won't happen. Um, we need to teach it, we need to, they need to experience it, and then we measure progress. Number two, a center of excellence for leadership crosses organizational boundaries. It is the advocate for leadership development. It works routinely on a consolidated, synchronized list of leadership activities across the university. It also provides focused programs. It develops a standardized measurement tool and then it increases leadership intentionality through a pretty aggressive leadership speaker series. And then finally, if done correctly, 
this program will change leadership culture across the entire campus. I don't want to end on a down note, but I want to quote uh, Dr. Tom Colditz again from Rice University and the Door Institute for New Leaders. And I'm going to end with this quote only because I think he shows the stakes associated with leadership development at a university. And he says, higher education graduates graduates 2.2 million students a year with college degrees and high school level leadership skills. And then business tries to make up for it with development programs. But for the most part, the graduates just have to live with what they get. And I think that's not optimum, and I think we can do better. And I think the uh, Center of Excellence for Leadership at Gardner Webb would go a long way in uh, uh, fixing that gap. And uh, that's all I have, and I'll stand by for questions. Thank you, Jim. If you will, there you go, if you will, I'll share your screen. Let me share my screen and we'll get started and work through our list today. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, and <clears throat> Jim, if you would, if you would uh, remind us who the folks you work with to make sure that we call the, them out for their, their help and support of the folks you work with and came in contact with at Gardner Webb. Okay, I did uh, several interviews. I uh, met with the provost, the deputy provost, the uh, chief finance officer, the chief IT officer, uh, endowment fund uh, manager, the legal counsel. Um, I'd have to go back. Uh, uh, met with a couple of people in the business school, met with the head of the business school. Um, did not meet with anybody in the athletic department. Um, kind of ran out of... Uh, uh, time for that. Met with uh, student development uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think that's a, off the top of my head, uh, kind of a listing of folks I met with. Okay. Very good, Jim. I, I know you uh, you did your due diligence. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm pleased that you did that. Um, and you've already talked about what you would do differently. You've circled back to your theoretical framework, Barger's. Um, that's kind of the, the, the whole notion of what you did. And so you circle back to that. Um, you talked about the courses that impacted you the most. Uh, you talked about your challenges. You talked about yourself as a leader. You talked about, you've reflected on how things have changed for you. Um, uh, so I think you have impacted our organization positively. You have started a discussion, um, and um, we see a pathway now for the undergraduates that the, the graduates uh, already have. But again, it's, um, I think, very intentional you know, not, not <clears throat> uh, that, that undergraduates need something like many, like many of the graduate programs provide. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, we'll move into the, the benediction part this morning. Um, as you know, to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, the program is about uh, a mind for learning, a heart for serving. Um, we, we become a family. Uh, your charge is to go out and provide service. Um, that's the, the entire notion of, of Gardner-Webb University for God and humanity service. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Hamilton always reminds you that you, you're on the, the only Gardner Webb that some people ever know. Um, and now that you have doctor in front of, or will have doctor in front of your name, they want to know what you know, not just your opinion. Uh, but the bigger part of that for me um, uh, is the part where you're, you're all the Gardner Webb that a lot of people ever know. Um, whether you teach or whether you administrate or whether you program coordinate or chair, doesn't matter. Um, you still represent the place. Um, and and Gardner-Webb is, big, is, a, is, is a bigger notion than just a, a little place to crossroads in Bull and Springs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the whole notion of a Christian university is impact, is service. Mm -hmm. um, that's what Christianity is. It's how you live your life and how you serve others. Um, and 
that that's the part that's going to that that's going to be different going forward. Um, is that you are seen as part of the organization when you get a doctor from that organization, good or bad, mm -hmm. and that you represent them. And I know that you will do that well, but that will be a change that all of you experience. Um, and so having, you know, from project coordination standpoint, um, having worked with Jim uh, through this, this is just a, a statement for anybody who might be watching this for prosperity later. I've enjoyed working with Jim. He's worked very hard. He's been very diligent. Um, uh, we had a we had a, a very tight group uh, of six that worked well together and have done an exceptional job with methodology, not because they had a good teacher, but because they're good students. Um, uh, and so I've been most pleased and honored to have worked with Jim and with all all six. Um, it's but it's it's as Jim pointed out, it's been a very much a cohort model, and everybody has shared in in success. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of that I've I've been blessed to get to work with you. It's been it's been a lot of fun for me. Uh, anybody have anything else, uh, Brad or Vic, before we go today that you'd like to say? Uh, anything you'd like to add? Good job, Jim. Well, thanks. Yeah. Friday is coming quick. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, fantastic job. Good work, yeah. Jim. I like the yeah. old model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have two prayers today. Um, and as Vic said, summer's coming quick. And so I have a prayer for service, as I always do. But I have a prayer for summer, too, because we it's coming soon. So... Let me share my screen and we'll, we'll close with our prayers today. Again, I've got two for us today. Uh, and so we'll go to our prayer of service. So if you'll pray with me, our prayer of service is from St. Teresa of Avila. Lord, let me serve you. Lord, help me respond to the slightest prompting of your grace so that I may be your trustworthy instrument for your honor. May your will be done in time and in eternity by me, in me, and through me. And our prayer for summer, uh, <clears throat> today's prayer is a summer prayer from Loretto College in Dublin, Ireland. Long, warm days and the pace of life slows. A time for picnics and rest in the shade. Lord, help me rest a while in the cooling shade of your presence. Slow down my restless heart and fill me with gentle compassion for all your people. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us today, Jim. Excellent job. I'd like to congratulate Dr. James Rennie, our newest DEOL graduate. Congratulations, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Jim. Thanks. We'll see you on Friday, Vic. Okay. All right. So, Bob, Jim. Let's see. I'm looking at my list here. I've got a couple. So, yep, Vic, at nine o'clock on Friday morning, you will be our fifth of the group. Um, and then we got to wait a couple of weeks for Angie. She's decided to go late. So she's not going until the 15th of July. Uh, but uh, I wish we would all got done this week. Uh, just for your sake. Um, I ain't got anything else better to do anyway. But uh, it time takes some of the pressure where you can enjoy the summer. All right. Everybody have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye, Brad. Bye, Jim. Bye. Bye, Doctor. See you later. See you Friday. Okay.